may look like in the future. First case we're going to look at is a fact pattern that's useful in a lot of uh, intellectual property situations relating to clawbacks, especially the software business, providing software services, providing software and, and providing backup for software or um, customer service packages or repair packages. So this is a 2003 case from uh, Missouri. So Vanguard Airlines entered into an agreement with Airline Automation and Airline Automation provided uh, software. So Vanguard could run its, run its airline. And the agreement was that uh, the debtor was provided by the defendant with a monthly invoice, so they get an invoice at the beginning of the month for an estimated amount. And then uh, during that following month, uh, the defendant would provide software and software services that varied depending on how much activity occurred in the debtor's reservation and flight data systems that month. So in other words, it's sort of, and this is, not atypical for a software company. Um, what's not atypical is that you're not getting an invoice afterwards. You're getting an invoice. You're getting an invoice in the month prior, or it could be sometimes it's in the year prior. And then, um, then the software company is providing the services and then it's getting paid. In this case, a little bit of unusual in, the, in that the invoice amount was an estimate. It wasn't a flat fee for these services. It was based on, on volume or the amount of work the software company had to do or other factors that the opinion didn't go into, uh, but it varied. So that was the agreement, uh, but it's an invoice generated. Uh, in other words, you're not shipping first or providing services first and then providing an invoice, which is more the typical way a vendor would bill. But here you're getting an invoice first and then you're getting services and then there's an adjustment of what's actually being paid. So uh, that was the arrangement and um, um, it also was modified a number of times. Under the new arrangement, um, and this is one of the modifications. Instead of requiring payment 30 days after an invoice with an estimated payment, I, I suppose in the original way, they would get some kind of a refund. In this way, payment was made on a, um, on a weekly basis. So the invoice was still generated at the beginning of the month, an estimated number but the actual amount of services that were provided were calculated on a weekly basis and payment was made at the end of the week. So Vanguard Airlines went bankrupt and the software company was sued for $136,727.23 representing payments that the defendant made during the preference period. The trustee argued that the payments received um, uh, was a legal obligation uh, and an antecedent debt, and an antecedent debt was created by the invoice that was generated at the beginning of the month. So an invoice was generated, payment, payments, in, the, in this case, under the amended agreement, they received four payments per month, but an invoice was generated at the beginning of the month and that was essentially paid and, it, and, and that satisfied the requirements. Remember, one of the requirements is that the trustee has to show the transfer, the payment that the trustee is seeking to call back was made pursuant to an antecedent debt. So the debtors argue, of course, there's a debt. We say, you know, the Vanguard sent an invoice and then there were payments uh, to settle that invoice. 
So the fact that there was an invoice shows that there was a debt, that this is a credit transaction. The defendant argued that the invoice is meaningless. That didn't create uh, any kind of a, a debt. Be why? Because the services hadn't been provided yet. I mean, if we provided the service, the software companies arguing, hey, if we had provided the services and then sent an invoice, then it's an antecedent debt. An antecedent debt was created and then the invoice is paid in 30 days. We can understand how that would be an antecedent debt. But here, we generate an invoice and then we provided the services later. An invoice by itself does not create an antecedent debt. Only the provision of value in the form of services or product creates, uh, creates an antecedent debt. Alternatively, which actually is actually is not completely an alternative argument, the defendant asserted that the payments were contemporaneous exchange for new value. In other words, the, the defendant is saying this should this should be taken out of the preference laws altogether, because what happened here was um, services were rendered and payment was made. So it's, it's another way, really, of arguing um, that there was an, an antecedent debt. I mean, there, it, it's broken into, into two defenses because one defense is there's no antecedent debt. There can't be a preference, period. The second argument the defendant is making, well, also, also there's a separate and discrete argument, the defense of contemporaneous exchange. Um, that also incorporates the concept as well, uh, but not based on on the on the invoice, that there was no antecedent debt, and that it, and that it's by itself a complete defense to this action. And the and and the, the defense basically says, um, unsecured creditors are not hurt if we're paid a hundred cents on the dollar because we provided value immediately. Uh, there was this is not a question of we're not in the class of creditors. We never became a creditor. Uh, we just did a contemporaneous exchange. Uh, we sold software services. We got paid immediately. End of story. Um, so that's the basic argument. Defendant also, of course, argued the subsequent new value defense, which is different. And that's basically saying we got a we got a alleged preferential transfer. And then right after that, we provided services. Um, as new value. That's the subsequent new value defense. The problem with that defense in this situation is that they got paid for those. They got paid. So many courts will say if you get paid for subsequent new value, it doesn't count. Uh, you cannot use that new value to set off a previous transfer. So the issues were pretty clear. Uh, were the payments made by Vanguard Airlines to the software company on account of an antecedent debt because an invoice was issued and the payments were made certainly somewhat related to that invoice, even though they were made on a weekly basis. So was there an antecedent debt or was there not an antecedent debt? Were the transfers substantially contemporaneous exchange for new value given to the debtor? So does that, does that defense apply or not? Or were the payments made to the debtor during the preference period protected under the subsequent new value defense? So those are the issues that the court faced. This is the relevant statute. 547B sets out the elements that the trustee needs to prove. We're focused here on we're focused here on 547b2, except as provided in subsection C and I of the of the section, the trustee may avoid any transfer of an interest of the debtor and property may avoid two for or an account of an antecedent debt owed by the debtor prior to, uh, before such transfer was made. So that's one of the elements. You notice there's an and after number four, and these, it's not, 
it's not it's not uh, uh, cafeteria style. Trustee has to has to have has, has to approve all of these elements. Five forty seven C. Those are, those are the defenses available to defendants. Here we're going to focus on five forty seven C one A. The trustee may not avoid under this section. You notice it doesn't say these the following under the following circumstances these transfers are not preferential. It doesn't say that. It just says the trustee may avoid or may not avoid. Here the trustee and the reason one reason you could argue why it, it, it doesn't address preferential and not preferential. One argument is that um, any transfer made by the debtor when the debtor is insolvent and can't pay everyone is arguably preferential. How could it not be? There's not enough money to pay everyone in full. You're getting paid in full. You've been preferred. So it's not really an issue whether the, the payment was preferential, not preferential. It's very simple. The trustee may not avoid under the section a transfer one to the extent that such transfer was a intended by the debtor and the creditor. Uh, I'm not going to read the rest of it, but the point is there's intention by both sides, both parties, that these are contemporaneous exchange for new value. In other words, eh, there's, there's not a debt created here. I'm selling you something. You're buying it. We're not extending terms. We don't want you to pay over time. We want you to pay now, immediately, or close to immediately, or right after we, we generate the services or deliver the product. Uh, we don't want to extend credit. We want to get paid ASAP. And frankly, usually there's a reason for that. And the reason the reason is showed is shown by a pretty uh, immediately following bankruptcy case. So obviously, um, in a lot of times where the contemporaneous exchange of, is found to apply, there's a reason why there was a contemporaneous exchange because. Uh, the software company may have decided, hey, we don't want to extend credit to these guys. This looks like a pretty shaky business. And in fact, it turned out to be a pretty shaky business. Um, the second element is that uh, the transfer must be, in fact, substantially contemporaneous. So in other words, just because the two parties intended that there was no credit transaction, if it ends up that the software was the software services were trans were provided to to Vanguard and then Vanguard took 60 days to pay it may have been the intent that this should have been contemporaneous but ended up not being so you have to show both elements 547c4 is a subsequent new value defense. Five forty seven C four. Actually I'm gonna read the four part. Two or four the benefit of credit to the extent that after such transfer, after after such transfer, such creditor gave new value. That's why it's called the subsequent new value defense. So the way this works is you get a transfer, preferential transfer, or alleged preferential transfer, and then after that you provide um, new value. You provide services. Most courts, or a lot of courts, are going to say those services could not have been paid for. In other words, you took a loss on those services. Some courts uh, disagree, and it's a complicated issue. Anyway, that's one of the arguments being made here. We provided software. Um, uh, the opposite. We got paid, and then we provided software. Well, the court looked at the the antecedent debt issue and ruled that an invoice does not create uh, an antecedent debt. Uh, so in other words, a debt to the defendant by the debtor did not arise until the defendant provided services. So just because you send an invoice that does not create uh, an antecedent debt or the timing of the creation of an antecedent debt is not controlled by an invoice that's rendered 
prior to the rendering of product or services. It's a very important concept. The court also ruled on the contemporaneous exchange defense and decided if you looked at what happened here, clearly the parties intended uh, by this very, very short payment schedule that services would be provided and then they'd be paid for pretty much immediately. So if they're, if they're provided all week and then they're paid for at the end of the week, that's, a, that's contemporaneous. They're provide, they're, they're, that each day is not being paid for but it's substantially contemporaneous. That's why there's the qualifier there. And the parties intended that this be a contemporaneous exchange. In other words, there's no intention of extending credit. We'll provide the software and the services, then you pay us immediately. Um, and so uh, the court ruled that this was protected uh, by the contemporaneous exchange uh, uh, defense and the software company was successful in defeating the trustee's attempt to find, uh, to claw back uh, these monies. Well, this basically just repeats what I already said. That's why substantially, that's why contemporaneous is qualified by substantially, by the way. It's, it's an important distinction. You don't have to be paid immediately can be paid substantially contemporaneous, whatever that means. And some courts have found that that can be as long as 14 days. So in other words, under certain circumstances, the parties could intend uh, that it's not a credit transaction, um, uh, but the debtor didn't pay right away. Maybe it had to process the invoice. Maybe there was a gap between delivery of the product and examination of the product. But the important thing is the defendant in the court's opinion and after looking at the facts uh, found that um, uh, there was no intent uh, to create a, uh, a credit transaction. No credit was given. The defendant and the, and the debtor both agreed. This is, this is, you know, this arrangement was intended to be, I provide, you pay, that's it. And that's essentially, uh, uh, substantially what happened. Okay, I'm not gonna beat a dead horse. That's my summary. This is a case from South Carolina, 2005. And it's an example of why it's frustrating to be a lawyer because you have a very similar, somewhat similar set of facts to the prior case we discussed. But here, the court takes a very, very different uh, view and a very different analysis. So Spartan International was in the uh, textile business as a manufacturer and Softmart was a licensed reseller and distributor of Microsoft software. The, uh, the defendant here, Softmart, agreed to resell a license to use uh, uh, so software, sold that to the debtor. And it was an agreement on payment, which uh, Spartan defaulted on. It's always a bad sign. Then there's, an, then there's another agreement um, and an invoice is generated and the debtor doesn't pay that either. Uh, Spartan doesn't pay that either. I call Spartan the debtor, but you have to remember at the time that all this took place, Spartan's not a debtor yet, didn't file for bankruptcy. This is all pre-bankruptcy history, which is always the playing field of the preference analysis. Everything happened before the bankruptcy. So the, uh, the, the software provider did not demand the return of the software or require that the um, debtor or soon to be debtor stop using the software. It's important to note that before, before things went sour, I assume, at Spartan, 
Spartan historically paid invoices in the 14-day range. So, during the magical 90-day preference period, defendant received $27,699.21 from Spartan. And uh, trustee sues uh, to get these payments back as a, uh, as a clawback. It's interesting here just to note is that this is an involuntary petition and that, that can have uh, an influence on, on, uh, on preference analysis. So the defendant argued that there's no antecedent debt because the trustee had not conceded in discovery that the debtor had actually received the software. So the defendant is arguing there's no antecedent debt because no debt is created unless a product or service is actually provided. And here all you had was an invoice and that didn't create a debt. The trustee argued that payment was not in the ordinary course of business uh, because payment was much later than 14 days. So it was not consistent with prior, prior payments. The defendant also argues that the transfer was protected by new value because the, the, the debtor was in uh, continued, and this is an alternative argument, that the debtor, and the reason I'm saying that is because this argument assumes that the debtor was in possession of uh, the software and, and, and the license to use the software. So alternatively, the defendant is arguing, well, if the debtor had been in possession, then new value was provided because, um, because it was in continuous possession. And this is an argument you see a lot in the context of software uh, and licenses to use software is that um, uh, the debtor is continuously, in other words, it's not, it's not like we're shipping bananas on Wednesday and then we're getting paid a month later. Uh, it's a whole different ball of wax because here the debtor is constantly using the software every single day. So when eventually payment is received, you can argue that it's a contemporaneous payment um, because the day before and when the payment is received, the debtor is still using the software. The debtor is continuously using the software. And this argument um, uh, can be a winner. Um, whether it's a winner here, we're going to find out in a second. So what are the issues here? Whether the trustee met his burden under 547B, one of the elements of that, one of the elements of his burden is to show that there's an antecedent debt. But here, uh, the trustee has not conceded that the, the debtor has even received the, the product. So how can there be an antecedent debt? Number two, was the transfer protected by the ordinary course of business or not? Number three, was this a contemporaneous exchange for new value? Because the, the, the debtor had the software this whole time and the license the whole time. It's uh, every day the debtor has this and, and is using it. 547B again. Was there an antecedent debt? 547C again. Was there ordinary course between the parties? Did, did, did the, does the defendant have an ordinary course defense? Five forty seven. Okay, first the court found found that uh, clearly there was an antecedent debt because there's testimony and there's evidence that the software was delivered. And there's no evidence on the side of the debtor not having received the software. And so they got the software. So an antecedent debt was created. Additionally, the court opined that the transfer would have related to an antecedent debt anyway, even if the product had not been received because there was an invoice that established uh, the debt. This is dicta since 
this is not the case. The case was that um, the software was delivered, and there's a finding that it was delivered. But you could see this dicta contradicts the last case that we looked at, which said that an invoice by itself is not sufficient to create a, uh, an antecedent debt. Anyway, so there's a, there's a difference of opinion as to whether uh, an invoice creates an antecedent debt or not. But this is dicta, so it's not a holding. So it has no presidential, precedential, not presidential, I'm thinking of the elections here, precedential value. As to the ordinary course defense, the court found that is non-existent because uh, the how the debtor was paid, how the defendant was paid in the preference period um, is very, very different from how it was paid in the, in the comparison period. So that's gone. Now the court turned to the new value defense, the contemporaneous exchange for a new value defense. And it made an interesting ruling. It noted that the debtor didn't use the software, gained no benefit from the software, its receipt, its license, whatever. Now, the software was of no use to the defendant and it didn't use it at all. Uh, so if it hadn't gotten the software, uh, it wouldn't have made any difference. Um, so the court found, uh, you know, the debtor, the debtor money went out for the software, but the, but, but the debtor didn't get any value uh, for the money, either as a subsequent um, new value defense or as a contemporaneous exchange new value defense, doesn't matter. There's no new value because there's no value because the debtor didn't use it. So that defense was, was denied as well. And unfortunately for this software provider, uh, payment was found to be uh, completely avoidable. So some of the takeaways here, um, well, this is Softmart being sued again for a preference, but this time the facts are, are a bit different. This is Illinois 2005. This is district court level uh, cases and an appeal. So the debtor was in the business of manufacturing railroad products. Softmart, of course, provided uh, Microsoft software. Uh, Softmart was a reseller, provided software to the debtor. And uh, during the 90-day preference period, Softmart uh, received four payments totaling 98,000 pursuant to a contract that it had um, with the debtor. After filing bankruptcy, the bankruptcy court authorized the debtor to assume and assign its agreements to a third party. So debtor is selling things off. One of the things it's selling is um, the right to uh, the software contract. Soft, Softmart, and this is, I don't think I've ever seen this before, uh, but they filed uh, uh, a, a, uh, a, they filed suit to get a declaratory, a declaratory statement, declaratory judgment by the bankruptcy court that the 98K uh, um, cannot, be re cannot be returned based on a new value argument. The bankruptcy court agreed and found that uh, uh, Softmart provided new value and uh, and that there was no preference. There was an appeal by the trustee, and here we are. The committee argued that Softmart's forbearance, one of the arguments Softmart made is that um, there was a breach in the contract, but we didn't inform Microsoft before the bankruptcy. And because we didn't inform Microsoft, uh, you were able to assume and assign this contract, and therefore, we provided new value to the estate because you've got money for the contract. It was worth something. And if we had gone ahead and told Microsoft that you were in default, tattletailed on you, then uh, you wouldn't have gotten anything. So we provided new value. Um, this is a forbearance argument uh, that typically doesn't work very well in the context of new value 
um, cases. It's worked sometimes. That's why people still try to use it. But I would say the, in the large majority of times, forbearance is typically not found to be new value. Um, software also made another, the typical provisioner of software argument that we provided new value uh, because you continue to use our, our software. It's a continuous use of our software. So we continue to provide uh, new value after, after the transfer. So it's a subsequent um, new value defense. This is the argument they were making. So did they provide new value and is forbearance uh, does for forbearance consist of new value as well? Applicable, applicable, I think I can say that, applicable section, if I say it fast, 547C4, which is what they're basing their argument on, and the court's ruling. As to the new value argument, um, the court found that, uh, well, based on the testimony, based on the testimony on the record in bankruptcy court um, the district court noted that software did not provide anything new after it received payment uh, pursuant to the contract uh, it received payment and it just continued to provide what would what was uh, already paid for um, so there are two problems with the new subsequent new value argument and um, one of them is that it was fully paid for in other words if they did provide new value uh, it was already paid for by the previous uh, payment and generally speaking new value has to be unpaid for also the problem is that they didn't supply anything new they were just continuing to supply what they what, the, what they already agreed to supply. It wasn't, it wasn't new product or services um, that provided value, a new value to the debtor. So district court denied that argument. Also, the court found that uh, forbearance is not new value and uh, maybe Microsoft would have continued with the contract anyway, who knows? So Microsoft could have, could have done whatever it wanted to do. It didn't have to revoke the licenses. And there just wasn't evidence. And that's the problem with forbearance. It's hard to show concrete, definitive value to the estate. And here it's at best speculative value to the estate. And the court found it just wasn't sufficient as new value. This case is a good example of why providing evidence of new value and what exactly the new value is and why it's worth what you're claiming it's worth is crucial in the context of uh, preference cases. A 2004 case, bankruptcy court level. Okay, so the defendant provided equipment, software, and maintenance to the debtor pre-petition. And uh, of course, the debtor goes bankrupt and the uh, defendant is sued uh, for the recovery of preferential transfers. What's interesting here is that the defendant argued and, and the court did not dismiss the argument uh, outright that the provision of software after the last transfer made by the debtor, so it's under 547C4, the subsequent new value defense. Again, the new value has to be delivered after an alleged preferential transfer to be able to set off that transfer. So. The, the defendant argued that we provided equipment, we provided software, we provided maintenance service. So all that stuff should be, the value of all that stuff should be set off. It just totaled everything and said it should be set off against the transfers. And the, the trustee argued that uh, no new credit was supplied by the debtor 
uh, beyond that provided in the original contract um, for these products and services. And the equipment was paid for, so the equipment can't be new value. Relevant statute. Creditor gave new value. So um, what's the new value? You've got, to, you've got to prove it. And here the judge found that, um, although the judge, you could tell in the opinion, seemed sympathetic, just didn't have the evidence. Um, so the equipment was already paid for. So that's not new. Uh, and the equipment was delivered actually prior to the, uh, prior to the preferential transfer. So it, it was not subsequent to the transfer. So that's completely out. Then the court noted software was provided and uh, defendant did not receive a payment for it. So theoretically, um, the continuing provision of the software should have had some kind of new value, but no valuation was provided. Apparently there was no expert report. There was no valuation reducing that pro rata use of the software between the preferential or alleged preferential transfer and the date of the bankruptcy, that period of time, what was the pro rata value of using that software? And no evidence was supplied. So the judge simply had to deny that uh, defense completely um, uh, because uh, no information on valuation. You've got to provide some kind of information on valuation if there's ambiguity as to the value of a product or service. I mean, typically, you show new value by, uh, in, in case of a product, by showing the delivery of the product um, and the bargain for um, value of the product. In fact, you may need to show an independent expert report as to the value of the product if the trustee is not stipulating to the value. And in the case of services, you may have to show timesheets. When exactly, uh, if you're an attorney or an accountant or a consultant, when exactly and what exactly did you provide? Where are the time records? The court's going to want that kind of evidence, that kind of specificity. Exactly what did you provide? When did you provide it? provide and it needs to know when because it's got to be subsequent so you've got to prove that by documentary uh, evidence or testimony specifically what was provided and when and evidence as to the value of what was provided here you had the what and the when but it's unclear what the pro rata value of continuing to use the software was. It's not that clear. Uh, did they even use the software? Uh, how much did they use the software? What was the value of the software in comparison to a previous period of software use? Was the software necessary at all? At all? It doesn't seem to be, uh, in this case, there didn't seem to be any testimony. There didn't seem to be sufficient documentary evidence um, um, that, that showed the pro rata value. So it was, it was denied. So that's the lesson and takeaway in this case. You've got to be extremely punctilious about providing specific information as to valuation if that's an issue in your, in your case, in, your, in the new value that you provided. As to the maintenance services, uh, the court found, yeah, you provided evidence uh, that you provided maintenance. Uh, that's fine. Uh, and the value of the maintenance um, is established uh, by the contract. And the, there was evidence for that and timesheets. And so great, you can have that. The problem is it wasn't worth very much. So what wasn't too much of a help. So there are two takeaways here. 
new value involving the provision of services is deemed given on the date the services are rendered, whether it's software, whether it's personal services, um, you have to establish the date and the value of the services on that date. I know I'm beating a dead horse, but it's very, very important or that defense will fail. And a lot of times that's the only defense you have. Also proving value. So when was the service rendered? How do you prove that? How do you prove the value of the service at the time it was rendered? I included this case because it's another issue involving, it's another case involving new value, but a slightly different issue, uh, but maybe not that different. But the point, of, the point of this case is that market value is not enough to determine the value of new value. In other words, you could have a piece of software or a license for a software that's worth X in the market and that's what the bargain for price was, but maybe the debtor never used it. It's, or, or, the, or it didn't fit in with what the debtor needed or something like that. And in other words, the analysis is what was the value, what, not what was the value of the software, what was the value to the debtor of the software? And it's, it's a big, big difference in analysis. So this was a restaurant company that hired Lawson Software and the defendant was required to deliver the debtor the software after 80k uh, after an 80k down payment under the agreement um, the restaurant group was in, responsible for installing the software and user training and all that stuff restaurant group goes bankrupt trustee tries to get the 80k back The defendant asserted that after they got the 80K, they delivered the software. And obviously it's worth more than 80K uh, because 80K was just a down payment. The debtor argued that, hey, we never used the software, so it's not worth anything. Uh, we didn't get any new value for it. The estate was not benefited uh, from the use of the software because we went bankrupt. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't use it. So who's, who's correct here? And this really is a, a uh, I, was, I guess a valuation issue, but it's really a, a, an argument of the type of valuation that, that the judge has to do to decide if there's, new, if, if there's new value or not. Five forty seven C again. Well, the court declined summary judgment for, in other words, both sides moved for summary judgment. The court said, there's a fact issue here. And the fact issue is, is whether the delivery of the software enhanced or returned value to the estate, um, return the 80 K back to the estate in the form of value. And there wasn't enough information in the motions to determine that. The judge needs to see more evidence. So he declined both motions. The takeaway here, it's not that complicated, is that a judge is going to make a determination. If value is disputed, sometimes it's not disputed. But if it is disputed, the judge is going to make a determination on, on, the, pro, on the value of the product and the service to the estate, not just its independent value, but the value to the estate. In this case, you had a design group as a defendant that uh, sold or licensed copyrightable materials and came up with a very creative argument 
Defendant was Nolan and Company Graphics and Advertising, Inc., and they provided packaging design, finished art, and catalog design for the debtor, Superior Toy and Manufacturing Company, Inc. The defendant's position was that the debtor paid on average in 50 days um, in the two years prior to the preference period, and uh, the payments were roughly 50 days uh, after invoice in the uh, in the preference period. This case um, was around 25k in value as far as transfers during the preference period. Both parties filed summary judgment, and I'll go into the arguments in a second. And I'll go to the arguments right now. The defendant argued that trustee could not satisfy 547b5 which says that the trustee has to show that the that the defendant received more in the pre uh, bankruptcy period than it would have received in a hypothetical chapter 7 case at the time of the transfer in other words uh, the defendant's getting more money now and in in a bankruptcy you would have gotten less money so that's one of the elements that the trustee has to show. And the defendant said uh, that this is impossible uh, because uh, the debtor would have had to um, pay anything that was owed to the defendant in full after the bankruptcy was filed if uh, those payments were not made in full in the preference period because if the debtor didn't pay, and you know, the defendant's talking about a hypothetical, a type of hypothetical situation, uh, which is um, encouraged by 547b-5, which creates a hypothetical situation. Would the, would the defendant have been paid more in a hypothetical Chapter 7 cases? So people tend to get a little bit carried away, in my opinion, with these hypothetical defenses. Uh, they really go out on a limb, but that the hypoth hypothetically the defendant argued, hey, uh, unless the debtor, uh, unless the court is going to conspire uh, with a violation of the Copyright Act of 1976, then the defendant would have had to be paid in full uh, in a later bankruptcy case. So in a hypothetical Chapter 7 case. And so... Uh, we weren't we weren't paid more in the preference period than we would have been paid in a hypothetical chapter seven case and the, the and the defendant argued this is contemporaneous anyway um, uh, if you don't buy that argument you can buy this one this was a contemporaneous exchange for new value okay so this is the statutes that are they're being cited as a defense. At least this one is for the contemporaneous exchange of new value, 547C1A. And this is the ordinary course. Defense. The court rejected the defendant's argument. I think it was a creative argument. These are creative people, but it didn't work. And the court basically said, you know, look, you already granted the debtor a non-exclusive license to use your designs in their, uh, on their toy boxes or whatever. Um, the fact that the money is going to be clawed back doesn't make any difference. That doesn't all of a sudden constitute a legal revocation of your prior grant it's granted it's done so no one's going to have to pay you and no one's going to have to make this up in a hypothetical chapter seven case i think it's a great great argument but uh it just doesn't work um because the court's right it, it's not going to a clawback is not going to have that impact of undoing a grant uh anyway the court says uh you know, put the last nail in the coffin of this argument is that uh, is that these catalogs were printed and delivered 
pre-petition. So this is a pre-petition claim anyway. In other words, a pre-bankruptcy claim. It's a pre-bankruptcy claim. Um, so it would not be an administrative claim. What's the difference? An administrative claim, generally speaking, could be in a hype. And, and again, it's hypothetical. It doesn't have to be paid 100 cents on the dollar. But just to continue with the defendant's hypothetical, uh, might be paid 100 cents on the dollar. But a pre-petition claim, if the debtor's insolvent, which it, which it was in this case, is not going to be paid 100 cents on the dollar. But the court is saying it doesn't matter because you're not going to get an administrative claim anyway in, in a hypothetical Chapter 7 case. In a hypothetical Chapter 7 case, you would have a hypothetical pre-bankruptcy unsecured claim. So the argument fails. As to the contemporaneous exchange defense, no luck there either. Um, the, the checks cleared the bank 83 days after the invoice date, there's nothing contemporaneous about it. And so that's not in the cards either. Um, the, actually, the contemporaneous exchange argument can work in the context of the transfer of copyrighted material if the agreement between the parties states that the license or other intellectual property, I would think, but I have seen cases saying that this argument can work if the agreement states that the copyright um, and um, uh, the license to use the copyright is not transferred unless full payment is made. Then you might have an argument that um, the transfer did not actually occur. In other words, the transfer of, of the copyright did not occur until there was payment in which case you might be able to argue contemporaneous exchange. Um, but that wasn't the case here. So they had to return the money. Court also looked at the ordinary course defense and uh, <laughs> the defendant was just not winning anything here. The court found that the average was misleading, using the averages was misleading and the courts Court is a lot of times going to look at that and decide. sometimes the averages are not misleading but sometimes they are and the court found that here they are because uh, uh, the average included six invoices uh, you know half the invoices were over 75 and the other half were under 25 so um, and that and that did not comport with how um, uh, the debtor paid in the comparison period so the court found that each one, each of the transfers were preferential. There was no applicable defense. Uh, end of story. Uh, this is a case about trademarks. It's a district court case. The bankruptcy court granted the defendant's motion for summary judgment. So the trustee now is appealing. Discovery Zone was a chain of uh, entertainment oriented locales for kids and they sold uh, Pizza Hut pizza out of these locations and of course uh, they paid a trademark fee in connection with using Pizza Hut's name and during the well um, let me backtrack they went bankrupt <laughs> okay you can assume that if I'm talking about it they went bankrupt and then of course a preference period was created because they did go bankrupt and that's the three month period prior to the bankruptcy filing. And during that three month period, Discovery Zone kept on selling Pizza Hut pizzas, but they stopped paying the license fee. And this was after the last license fee payment to Pizza Hut. So they were, they kept up with the payments for a while and then they stopped. And during, and during their period that they stopped and, bef and up to the point that they went bankrupt, they were continuing to sell pizzas and they were continuing to, uh, to benefit from uh, this relationship uh, and this trademark without, without paying anybody for it. And so, and so Pizza Hut uh, asserted the new value defense. 
and basically said, hey, you know, they're using our trademark uh, and they're not paying for it. And this was subsequent to the alleged preferential transfer. So this is new value and we should be able to, to offset the prior uh, alleged preferential transfers with the value of um, value the value of the use of our trademarks uh, that they're not paying for. The bankruptcy court agreed and dismissed, uh, or rather granted, the um, defendant's motion for summary judgment, and the trustee appealed. And this is in, in Delaware, Third Circuit District Court. The trustee, the trustee argued, look, there's a there's a lot of case law on uh, tangible property being delivered maybe even loans being new value and tangible property being new value, product actually being shipped and delivered to the debtor. But tangible, ta I mean, um, intangible property, such as um, uh, trademarks uh, would be uh, too far an extension of the new value, uh, of the new value defense. It's too, it's too vague. It's, it's too incorporal and uh, should, should be denied. Uh, Pizza Hut, of course, argued that uh, trademarks should be considered new value, and there is a uh, Third Circuit precedent for that proposition. Well, you know, can, can the value of trademarks, can the value of trademarks be new value or not? 547C4 gave new value. So what is new value? Is, tra is a trademark that's being used and not paid for new value? Well, yes. The court said yes. The district court said the debtor was contractually bound to pay monthly royalty fees to Pizza Hut for the continued use of Pizza Hut's trademarks. Um, the Third Circuit had already held that trademarks may be considered new value, and then they should be considered new value here. Um, the court uh, deferred to the analysis of the defendant and found that the value of uh, uh, the, the value of the trademarks uh, offset um, a preference, a prior preferential transfer in the amount of one hundred sixty-four thousand eight hundred thirty-six dollars and 12 cents. What's notable here is that the trustee cited as precedent the Superior Toy case, which we looked at earlier, and the court in this case said, well, the big difference is that in that case, those copyrighted designs were sold, they weren't leased, and they were transferred prior to the um, uh, preferential or alleged preferential transfer. So it was a new value for those two reasons. Here, there was a continuing lease of a trademark uh, or use of a trademark that, um, that, was, that, that just wasn't being paid for, but it was being used. Also, what's important here is um, it had value. In other words, it brought pro profit to the company. It helped, the, it helped Discovery Zone. Uh, I, I'm sure they wouldn't have had it unless it was profitable and, uh, and produced revenue for the company. I mean, none of that was, was brought up here, but it could have been. I mean, it, w one of the issues, you know, is, you know, not only the market value of this trademark, but whether it was, whether it was used in the business. And clearly here it was. I decided to include this case. It's not really a clawback case, um, but it has some similarities. I'll just, I think it's worth noting in a, uh, in a, in a slideshow on clawbacks and intellectual property. It's a court of appeals case, 2001. And, and basically what this case is about is that, uh, there's a bankruptcy, there's a trustee appointed. And prior to that, um, there was, 
an attempt to perfect a security interest in a patent, in intellectual property. And the question was, essentially the question was, the trust, the question was, was this properly perfected? Was this interest properly perfected in the patent or was it not? If the, if the interest was not properly protected, then the trustee would succeed in his attempt to declare that there was no security interest in this particular patent. The patent was the main asset of the debtor, so obviously it's very important uh, for the trustee to attempt to preserve the full value of this patent for unsecured creditors, and it was equally important for the entity filing a security interest on this patent to make sure that it was a valid security interest and to, and to keep the patent out of the bankruptcy estate. So the argument that the trustee made here is that uh, the patent should have been recorded not only in the state of California with the Secretary of State, but it should have been recorded with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. It's a legal argument on the validity of a security, uh, the, the validity of a security interest and the process for perfecting a security interest. So if a security interest is not perfected uh, by a certain time, then the trustee is able to um, uh, assert a higher interest in the item. Well, the court decided based on the Patent Act text that the defendant, in this case the um, appellant, had perfected its security interest in the patent by recording it with the state of California. It's just an example of a kind of dispute that can happen um, with respect to intellectual property and perfecting security. So you want to make sure that you properly perfect or the trustee is going to uh, seek a determination that uh, uh, the the property is is free and clear of security interests and available for unsecured creditors. This is another case involving uh, perfection of a security interest in a patent, and this time the result was a clawback action. This is a 2007 case, bankruptcy level, in uh, Massachusetts. Well, here the, the debtor, Cold Wave Systems, was involved in uh, the design, development, manufacture, licensing, and sale of shipping, freezing, and storage systems. The debtor obviously needed money at some point, so it, it borrowed money from Gateway Manage, Management Services Limited, and in exchange, it granted Gateway a security interest in one of its valuable assets, which was a patent, which, well, which dealt with the, the, the debtor's proprietary freezing technology, etc. So the debtor defaulted at some point, and at that point, the defendant filed a transfer statement with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, and the defendant also filed two financing statements under the Uniform Commercial Code. Um, unfortunately, it should have filed them, uh, the defendant should have filed them earlier because it filed these statements seeking to perfect its security interests, probably anticipating a possible bankruptcy, uh, filed them within 90 days. One of, the, one of the statements was filed on the 90th day. That must have been painful when they later found out about the preference period. So it was filed on the 90th day, but that's, uh, the court determined that's, if you file on the 90th day, it's within the 90 days. Uh, so the 90th day and the 89th day, uh, they filed these uh, financing statements seeking to perfect their security interest. And uh, someone must be getting a tongue lashing for that. 
Anyway, the trustee asserted that the filing was ineffective to provide a security interest because under the California UCC, defendants should have filed in Massachusetts. Thus, defendant's security interest was not perfected until 89 days before the debtor filed for bankruptcy within the preference period. The defendant asserted that it took the security interest, foreclosed on it, and took possession of the patent by filing the transfer statement on the 90th day, so it's protected. Just to backtrack a little bit, a security, the transfer of a security interest, it doesn't look like a typical preference case because it's not payment to a vendor of money, but it's transfer, it's the transfer of property of the debtor. It's the transfer, it's the, it's the transfer of, of a valuable interest of the debtor in property. So it's the, it's treated as the equivalent of money. So if you file a security interest, um, you're transferring, you're transferring value and you're transferring it during the 90 day preference period. And so the net effect is there's less for unsecured creditors. And if you're in this case, you're perfecting the loan, uh, during the preference period. So there may be other lenders out there that didn't perfect during the 90 day preference period. So you're getting an advantage over potentially other folks, um, that are, that are unsecured. So that's just not to beat a dead horse, just to remember that. On or within 90 days, there's the language. Well, the court, the court looked at these arguments and basically said, Hey, both these statements fell within the preference period because the first was filed 90 days before the filing and it said on or before. And the second was filed 89 days prior to the bankruptcy filing. So the court found that the patent was in fact perfected, but it was perfected during the 90 day preference period. And also as a sideline, the court noted that, um, um, taking possession is not possible in this situation because it's incorporeal property. So it's, it, that, that's not going to be a method of perfection. So basically it was perfected, uh, but it wasn't perfected before the, I guess the point, the court, the point that the court is making is it wasn't, it was not perfected before the 90 day period by, by possession. It was perfected after the start of the 90 day period, but then it was a preference and the court found that it was preferential. The trustee met all the other elements, proved all the other elements that he needed to prove. And there wasn't an, there was not an available defense and it was deemed preferential and the, uh, security interest was, uh, was, uh, deemed, uh, non-operative. So well, the point is you can't transfer assets during the preference unless you have other defenses and assuming the trustee meets, um, all the elements that he has to meet, uh, the perfection of a lien is going to be, uh, avoidable, uh, like anything else.